Fran, good morning. It's Friday. The weekend is upon us. It is, Brad. Hello to you. Everything. How are you? Yes, um, I'm good. I'm looking forward to another one of our chats. And I was thinking today we could pick up a little bit where we left off last week on happiness. And I was thinking after our last conversation, I wonder what it is that triggers people to feel unhappy. And I wondered, is there something in, in the human race that makes us want to maybe please other people? And maybe this plays a huge part in, in how we are either happy or, or unhappy. I don't know what you're thinking on this, if you could start us off today. Yeah, you know what? I, so first of all, I think this is going to be um, a great talk today. I'm, uh, now that you, we mentioned that we're going to pick up on this one again, um, I'm quite passionate about this subject. I've been thinking about this a lot, to be honest. Um, I think there are many things that people do that contribute to them becoming more unhappy or at least stopping them from uh, becoming happy truly in, you know, with themselves. And, but there's many of those things, when, when you think about it, what could be the root cause somewhere um, for their behaviors, um, and you mentioned one of them, for example, is judgment of others, but it can also be other things. It can be envy, it can be hating people, um, and so on. I think the root cause is very often somehow is that when we're at one point in our life, and probably starts early when we're kids, uh, but also always you know, later during, during our lifetime, is that we begin to learn that other people that are somehow important to us have expectations on us. And we try to please those expectations or at least to not disappoint the person that is important to us somehow, to not disappoint them. That is something that we try to do. That's, I think, one of the reasons why, and it starts very often in family, uh, to be honest, that when you're, you're a kid, you finished school, you're grown up, by that time, you will have already learned from your parents what they actually expect you to do, for example, or expect you to become, how, to, how they expect you to be like as, as a man or a woman. Um, and or what, ex what behaviors do they want to see. And I think growing up, you don't question that all that much. That's just your starting point. So if your parents, let's say, were doctors and they really their secret wish is that you also become a doctor, you will feel a certain you know, pressure to actually please those expectations. Not, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize. Not everybody is uh, very receptive to that. But I think a lot of people actually at that age, they don't think about it all that much. And then they, out of a sudden, they, they don't want to disappoint their parents. I've been recently you know, working with uh, younger people, with students who told me in private, because they were not good at what they're studying, um, they asked them, why are you actually continuing? You're, you tell me you don't have the success, but you also don't want to put in the work. So why are you even here? And the answer was, it's because my parents want me to become an engineer. And they, they struggle with, they, they know this, again, you know, people often have the awareness at some point, they know this, but then they're kind of trapped in that. And I was actually, I hope this, this young man actually changed his way by now, because he was on a path for a deep level of unhappiness because he was doing something he doesn't resonate with at all. I wonder how many people are sitting at university today doing a course they don't like because their parents said they needed to go to university and get a degree. And it starts so early, Frank, you're absolutely right. Do you know how many patients I've seen over the years that tell me stories of when they were at school, they come back, you know, from a test and they say, Hey, mom, dad, I got 85% in my test. They're so proud of themselves. And like their parents turn around and they say, hey, what, what happened to the other 15%? Right. What? What did in you that, learn from that? In that moment, mm -hmm. all you remember is that 85% isn't good enough. And this is where it starts. And it's a slippery slope after that because then when your parents say, hey, listen, Frank, 
you should get a degree. What, uh, what are you going to study at university? What do we know at 16 years of age? I didn't. All I wanted to do was play football at 16. You have no idea. No because idea. you haven't tried anything yet. You don't, most people don't know what they're actually, what are the things that they could be passionate about because they have never experimented. Right. You don't know unless you try very often. You sometimes maybe people know this very early, but people don't, don't experiment at that age. What do you think makes us keep hold of those things, though, as we get older? You mentioned before how you don't really question things as a young person. You're right, right? We, we live by the rules that perhaps our society, our parents, our culture, religion, community puts on us. But once we're at university, actually, we're away from our families. We start to grow in our independence. What do you think holds people back from tapping into what makes them happy and rather than still continuing to follow the path that someone else is setting for them? I think it lies into, may I make it sound now like there's a simple answer and it's probably not always true for everyone, but I would say for, for a large part, I would hit the nail on the head when I say the, the root cause of that is that every being in this world, at least humans, um, have a desire to be respected and loved. I think that's just a very general statement that is probably true for most people on this planet. That's kind of their, that's some of their desires. Now, if you're going to do something in the, when in a university, for example, you figure out maybe that's not my way, you do want to do something else. At one point, you have to tell, for example, your parents who had this expectation that you go this path, and you will probably disappoint them. And I think connected to that is the fear that they may not love you as much anymore or respect you as much anymore. So you, you, you're afraid of that move. You just, don't, you just don't make it. And it's more, not just your parents, maybe also a, a broader uh, family or friends and so on. There's just whole expectations are a load that we carry. The, the interesting thing is we carry them voluntarily. We can get rid of them. But it feels like guilt. Yes, it feels like guilt. Because you owe them, your parents, you owe them something. Maybe you feel like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they raised you, they pay. That's the other thing. They may pay for your education. And now maybe halfway through, you're saying that's not for me. So, and then you are in this, in this trap. Like maybe you owe something. There's this risk of not being as loved and respected anymore. So um, people have, are just afraid of the decisions of changing them. Although they keep taking mom's and dad's money. And that's probably also often the problem. Uh, well, that doesn't help, right? Because that just reinforces the, the, the message even more. Yeah. Uh, but I do know from a, from a therapist perspective over the last 20 years, seeing people and patients a lot of the time, the damage is done not deliberately. It's done with throwaway lines, with comments children pick up and interpret. What we don't do is encourage people to really talk about what they want. Because when I'm listening to you, what I'm wondering to myself is, how did we become a race of people that don't know how to express and explore what we want? I have no answer to that. Do you have a theory? No, I, I think this is like the, the, the question that hangs over me. What's happened to our ability to really express what we want? So when I'm 12 years old, and my parents say, Brad, you know, you're gonna to go to university after school, you need to start thinking about what you're gonna do, why do I say, but I don't know what I want to do. It's as if we need to give ourselves permission, or maybe as parents, we need to give young people permission to say, I don't know if I want to do that. Yes, absolutely. You're 100% right. I love to encourage every parent to be proactively open about that to their kids, even if you don't have Act, even if you're in your, if in yourself as a parent, you're already open to that. You let your kid choose their own path. If you don't express it, more likely than not, the kid thinks you might have some level of expectations on them. So he's making it up for him, for himself or herself. 
So mm -hmm. telling your kid, like, I want you to find what makes you happy or what you resonate with, what you're passionate about or what you like doing. And I don't care what it is. I'm going to help you find it. I think this is already a huge deliberating step. Uh, of course it is. I think the caveat to it is at some point in the future, passion needs to be linked with talent in order to create a career that pays money to allow us to live. And I'm oh, not yeah. talking about last time we talked about, you know, the big houses and, right. and things. No, no, no. Just baseline survival, a house over your head, security needs med, food, etc. I can be passionate about becoming a footballer. At some point, if I have a lack of talent, <laughs> no amount of passion will get in the way of a lack of talent. And yeah. I may have to accept, you know, I have people in my circle, you know, who wanted to be musicians when we were younger. Classical musicians, rock musicians. And I know some who are in their 40s today, you know, and they still play guitar in a band and they rent an apartment above the pub and they still go around three nights a week playing gigs for 40 euros. They're not that happy actually anymore, Frank. Right. They're not because yeah, they, they didn't end up in a relationship that was satisfying. They didn't find that true path. They feel as though they missed their chance. Actually, they end up following a passion to start with that, that makes them a little bitter 25 years later. And, and I don't know what the balance is, but I see these people and when I talk to them, I feel a little sad inside that they feel like they've wasted their journey. Yeah, well, that's... Mm, so first of all, I, I would like to say, you're right, it's the ideal point is when passion matches talent. Mm -hmm. But it's not just black and white. So it's not just you either have 100% uh, talent or 0% talent. There's also a lot in between. And I would say if you have enough talent to do something that allows you to sustain yourself in a, in a way that is enough for you, then you don't have to be, you know, the amazing world football star, you know, something like that. If, if you are okay with that, or if you're, I don't know, maybe you're a painter or you're a musician, um, or you are, I don't know, maybe a salesman, doesn't matter if you're good enough, plus you have the passion for it. That may already be enough. If it's, a, if it's a complete contrast between what you love doing and you absolutely suck at it, then of course that's not going to work. However, I, yeah, oh, no, go on, you finish. one thing is to your example with the couple that's playing the music since 26 years and they're not so happy with that anymore, their life is not over. They can start something else. It's just that very often people think they are, are trapped in this and they maybe don't have the confidence to start something new or experiment and so on. That, that's another trap that you can put yourself in, thinking that you're too old, your life is over. Right. Right. Uh, and this maybe goes to your point of, you know, this, uh, we, we live to be loved and we live to be respected. Yeah. Maybe happiness starts when we love and respect ourselves. That's the starting point. That is absolutely the starting point. I'm sure you must have also, you know, a wealth of stories from your practice where you figured out that people, uh, people's problems are rooted in that they don't love themselves enough. Of course, uh, Frank, I was sharing with, uh, with my father who watched our last episode the other day we were talking. He says to me, so come on then, where, how did you find happiness? You've had some challenges in your life. I said, yes, first of all, it's putting them in perspective because somebody else always has a worse problem than me. Um, but I told him I found happiness sitting under a tree with my dog, owning nothing, literally nothing. And if I could find happiness with nothing, imagine what it would feel like if I actually <laughs> had something. So no relationship, no home, no job, no money, just me, my dog and nature. And to be able to find that happiness started with loving and respecting myself and not beating myself up, not trying to live by other people's standards. You talked about that judgment of others. 
And you mentioned last time, I found it really interesting as well, when you were saying some of us uh, want to buy the house so that our neighbors can see what we have, or the nice, you know, the Audi R8 that we can't really afford. And this makes me, makes me sad for those people when they're living to please others. Yes. So if they're not prepared, if I can't look in the mirror and say, actually, I like this guy. Actually, I love this guy. No one's going to want to say it to me. I've got to be able to do it to myself. So I must be able to make myself happy. And this I see a lot with patients over the years, right? They look to other people, not just for the judgment, Frank, but they look to other people to make them happy. Yeah, that's not going to work. No, it's not. We have to be able to sustain ourselves before we can look to others to sustain us. And it's getting the order right. Order is so important. And I think if we're looking to others for judgment, for respect, for love, we need to turn the mirror on ourselves and say, actually, I need to love, respect, and judge myself. And within that, I totally believe there's happiness to be found. Because if you can get comfortable with who you are, love what you look like, love what you sound like, you know, just even listening to people talk about their voice. How many people do you know like to listen to their voice on the, on the uh, answer phone machine? I don't remember anyone who ever said, I think that sounds great. Right. <laughs> we don't even like to hear ourselves. Yeah. We need to maybe in this sort of age of Aquarius that we live in, this more holistic approach to life. Maybe the opportunity of what COVID has done by making us all lock down together is given us the opportunity to really appeal to ourselves to say, do I give myself permission to respect myself? Do I give myself permission to love myself? And do I give myself permission to be happy? What about that? Giving ourselves permission to be happy. I don't know what you think on that. I think that's good, but I think that's, you know, I'm just imagining this, to be honest, because I haven't gone through this myself, just maybe from people and friends that I know um, that share some stories with me and how they feel, is on the one hand side, they know that that's the step they should take, but then there are always things that are holding them back that have to do with feelings of guilt on things they've done or not done, um, and um, and I think there's a, there's a part of forgiveness or making good on mistakes or something like that that for these people have to happen before they can act on the statement I'm giving myself permission to love myself. Frank, you're right. The risk with that is for some of us, we're trying to fulfill a need of our parents, and they might not even be on the on the world anymore. They right. might have passed on, and we're still trying to satisfy their needs for us. Sure. Um, I, I wonder, you know, um, in the Buddhist culture, uh, they talk a lot about compassion. Um, and without it being a, a religious, fervent uh, statement, we need to be able to look at ourselves and treat ourselves with compassion. Oh, yeah. And maybe that's the starting point for people who are still trying, you know, who need those steps that you talk about in between moving from being unhappy to happy. That's good. Yeah, that's a good one. I think this is a good point. And there may be a few people for, for whom, you know, getting away from continuing to live the expectations of others when they're a little bit more mature, but they're ready to do it, but they haven't even realized yet that they're still on a path that is not you know contributing to their happiness in some way um so imagine you're i don't know 40 years old 45 you already have your your house it's on loan of course you have to pay it off and uh, you have that expensive car in your garage and it's also not paid uh, really but you live in this wonderful neighborhood and um you think that that's um it's meeting your expectations, it's meeting the expectations that 
maybe your parents had you know wished for you as as life circumstances and so on and so forth but um you realize it's not really the right right path and i think there are probably also a lot of people right now who are in that that phase they don't have anything to forgive themselves for at least nothing very fundamental they just they just um how do you say it? they're just used to being on that path and now may be a good time for them to actually rethink and add a few things that or also or remove a few things that they keep doing that's not uh, you know adding to their happiness but maybe frank is to, to your point which i think is accurate maybe there's like you know there's a couple of steps we can take the first most important step as in any kind of recovery is we have to recognize and admit that we're unhappy this is the most courageous toughest bravest step we make to recognize to myself maybe to others i'm unhappy right and then the second step is to offer ourselves compassion allowing ourselves to be upset by that fact that we're not happy and to be kind to ourselves and then maybe the third step is to give ourselves permission to be happy so we have to recognize it first we have to be kind and compassionate to ourselves because we recognize it and then we have to give ourselves permission in order to be happy and if we're able to maybe adopt those three positions recognition compassion permission maybe we can start on a path where every day we can enjoy ourselves a little bit more and not worry about what the neighbors think or worry how am i going to pay the loan back or is that really the job i want to be doing every day do i want to be commuting yeah, yeah. Or, or even you know be so bold and say all right so i'm to be honest i'm living a life that i can't really afford that i have to work my ass off for the next 30 years if i even live that long uh maybe you go and sell your house and your car and live somewhere where you can actually afford uh so you and re reduce all that stress because it is a big load i remember when i had a, a, you know, a loan on, on the house when i was younger we you know, just bought it and i i hated that feeling that i'm not even free to change really you know not just be able although i never wanted to but to not have that freedom to say right next year i'm just gonna just take a trip around the world and just see it or something like that no because the bank will have their payment every month and i have to have that income that i committed to right. while i was young and foolish taking that that big loan you know so you know, personally i did everything in my power to you know, pay it off as quickly as possible because i could not stand this not feeling free it really ate into my my happiness there was a constant i don't know pressure about this that that was there well and it's it's a cycle then isn't it it's a vicious cycle because the more you do the more successful you become the more you borrow or loan or grow and then suddenly you might have family and then you've got kids oh, yeah. or at school you've got the house you can't then just leave the job because now you have responsibilities mm -hmm. and you know i i've mentioned before i had a friend many years ago he he rose very quickly to a partner level in an accountancy firm frank on a weekly basis when we would get together for a drink he would complain and moan and bitch about his job he hated it and i would say to him you know put up or shut up yeah and he'd be like oh i can't leave you don't understand two of my kids are a private school and there was always a really good reason why he could not leave and you know what he's still there <laughs> right he'll be 50 senior partner still hates it yeah god that's uh, actually terrible i am I'm, I'm sure there are i don't know how many people will in the end end up watching this episode but i would bet there's a large portion of people random people in there that totally resonate with that feeling you know i think did, did we mention it last time or was it in something else where, where yes i think last time we mentioned it about 70 percent of people anonymously say they hate what they're doing yeah right yeah so that, and that's 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 really big and um yeah so that's uh i think if people would, would just stop and say all right um i'm i'm putting my, myself under too much pressure 
And why am I even doing this? You just take a moment to get the awareness of why are you doing this? For what? Do Is you, it worth it? But, well, there's the question, right? Is it worth it? Because we can sit here very comfortably and say, well, you know, everyone should be asking this question. Is it worth it? Who, who are we to judge that? I don't judge. It's a question that everybody needs to ask himself. The answer might be yes. Right, well, this is where I'm, I, why I'm asking it, right? right? Maybe the answer is yes, it, it is worth it. Because they do want to live like that. Actually, they are driven by the opportunity to please others, to be judged by others. They want that house, they want that car, they can live with the loan, they don't mind the stress. Are they truly happy, Frank? How are we even defining happiness? And maybe this is something I've been thinking about since our last conversation. What is happiness, by the way? What does it mean to be happy? It's quite subjective. It will be subjective. It, it will definitely be. So um, I think uh, it's, it's much easier defi to define through, you know, indicators, in, you know, that happen to you, I'm sorry, that, that you feel um, around you and in yourself rather than trying to make a one-size-fits-all um, definition of it, to be honest, you know? So it could be for you, happiness is that, uh, that you have a partner that, that you love and, and you, you love back. For other people um, who don't have that, maybe that mat doesn't matter so much. For, for them, happiness is defined as that they have no financial worries. Mm -hmm. Or other people say, I'm, I'm actually happy when I'm looking forward to Monday morning because that's the time when I can continue doing what I love for a living. Could be. And, but ideally, you know, I think ideally there's multiple of those facets somehow. Mm. Um, but it will be very individual and probably also changes over the course of life. Yes, no doubt. Do you, do you think it's easier to recognize unhappiness? Yeah, yeah, I think, what I think are the that might be the for case. You? When you're talking to young people, when you're talking to friends, what are the real triggers for you that enable you to see that someone is unhappy? Maybe you can help some of the guys watching this to be able to question, actually, am I unhappy maybe that's the starting point right yeah well i tell you what i actually have to repeat it i i, I think the the most common source of unhappiness for young people around the age of 20 to 25 that i have talked to is that they have they feel they're obliged to live by the expectations of uh, of their parents that's the most common one there may be other things also, you know, people have all sorts of things that make them, make them uh, unhappy. It, you know, can be that, I don't know, they have a disappointed love or whatever it is. But the most common one I'm, 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 I'm certain is that people live by the expectations of others. And they know it's not their way, they feel it, but they, they don't know the way out. Plus, they're afraid and disoriented sometimes. So when you're 20, and you don't really know what, we talked about that earlier, you know, what is it that, um, that makes you happy or what would be, what's going to be your path for the future if you have never experimented and your parents are saying, right, we think it's this, but you yourself has no idea, so you go on that path because you know your parents mean well. Most parents mean well. I would say all, almost all parents mean well. And so you go on that path, but then do you have the courage them to say, no, that's not it? A lot of kids have that. I've just had that issue, Brad. I, I think it, it makes me feel as though there's a phrase here around bravery and your own path. Mm -hmm. You know, to find your own path, you need to be brave. Um, and perhaps happiness comes out of knowing that you've had the courage, the bravery to choose your own path. Yes. Not and express it. So here's one thing. I think, let, let, me, let me try to help the, uh, the kids in that kind of situation. If you think you're living the expectations of your parents, first of all, verify if that's even true. 
Mm. You can go to your mom and your dad and say, what would you actually think if I would tell you I now rather want to be, I don't know, a mechanic or a medical doctor and not the, not the thing that I'm trying to do now. And they might, they might say, yeah, that's cool. Would be a little bit of a waste of the one year of money that we put into you, but why not? We want you to be happy. Could be that they say that you would just have the assumption that they have this expectation on you. That could be the case. Now, if your parents are saying, uh, oh yes, you're definitely going to be that engineer because that's a secure job, that's blah, 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 whatever. You still need to have a conversation with your parents. The question is just how. Mm. And my advice is to lead with empathy. You have to go to your mom and your dad and say, I know that you want me to be safe. I know that you want me to have this degree so that you don't, I don't have the same financial worries that you have, may have had you know, earlier in your life. I know that you think this is the best thing for me. But I also need to tell you that I think I'm carved out for something else. And I understand that you may be worried now if I change my path because you love me and I love you back. But I need to do this because I know this is where I need to be. That's the conversation that you need to have. In my view, what do you think? Look, I know from personal experience, this is the conversation to have because I can take you back 30 years to 1986, 1987. My older brother, very, very intelligent young man, passed all his exams, you know, really high level, grade A's for everything. And he won a place at uh, the prestigious University of Cambridge to study economics. Our father um, at the time was a finance director of a national charity, a chartered accountant. So you can imagine the, the pride everyone felt at you know, the first boy from our village to be going to Cambridge. Wow, you know? Yes. Well, um, my brother was a, a Baroque flautist. You and I might see that as a, like a recorder player. He wanted to be a musician. He didn't want to be an accountant. <laughs> right. <laughs> He'd done the interview and took the exam because at 17, he did what his parents said. But as he got closer and closer to going to Cambridge, he was getting more and more upset. And we're like, just tell mom and dad. Oh, they want me to be an accountant, you know? Anyway, so he goes to my parents and he says, not dissimilar to the conversation you just like hypothetically suggested. Hey, I know that you want me to go to Cambridge. I know you want me to be an accountant, but I think I'm meant to be a musician. And he won a place at the Royal Academy of Music to study. Wonderful. So he negotiated with my parents that he would postpone Cambridge for one year and he would go to the music college for the year. And if at the end of that year, it didn't look like he was made for music, he would go to Cambridge. But he didn't want to wake up in 30 years time, he said, in a job that he hated because of something he didn't ever want to do. Yeah. So my parents yeah. agreed with the negotiation. He went to music college and now um, he is the most eminent Baroque flautist globally. He runs a beautiful ensemble. He lectures at the Royal College of Music. He's a dean at this place. He's going to be knighted on. You know, he lives in the world of classical music, and that's where he made his passion. Wonderful. Love the story. Right? So your story of how to have that conversation, I don't think has changed in 30 years. I think today we have a world where actually young people are even more enabled than maybe we were when we go back 30 years to when we were teenagers. Yeah. I suppose for them, they're living with their parents and that's a great conversation. When I tell that story, I'm wondering, and I wonder what your thoughts are. What happens when you're 35 and you already did what everybody wanted you to do? You lived for the judgment of others. You've already got that house that you can't quite afford. Um, how do you touch happiness 
when you're already sucked in. Because grabbing them when they're 18, 19, 20, that's great, before all the trouble starts. But what about when we're 20 years into a career that doesn't make us happy? What, Frank, what do we do then? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one because it's in, there are two interesting sides to it. On the one hand side, uh, you now have a broader field of vision than when you were younger. So you have some idea of what else might go and so on. But at the same time, I think over, let's say you've been, you know, doing that since 10 years, 15 years or something like that. Most people over that period of time lose courage. Mm -hmm. When you were young, 19 years old or something like that, for you to move to another city and then start your study, you didn't even think about it as a threat. Right. You yeah, had nothing. You yeah, you couldn't wait. So now you have stuff and you're afraid of losing it. You're more afraid of maybe that things are not going to work. I think adults get more cautious uh, over time. And at that point, a lot of people will have to work back their way to having enough courage to actually changing the way. That's, that's also an interesting journey. And it will probably take some time for you to work up the courage. It's probably, a lot of it is just in your head. But if you really generally think, genuinely think that there's a lot, you have a lot of things to lose, uh, if you now change, that's going to be hard. I think you also need to change perspective on your life a little before you find the courage. Uh, and I think, you know, you, you remind me of a, a line from uh, my favorite movie character, Rocky Balboa. You know the boxer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when, when someone's got nothing to lose, that's when they're most dangerous. Right. When you've got something to lose, you're frightened, you're nervous. But when you've got nothing to lose, you're dangerous. And I think it's this feeling that most people, when they're in that situation, they feel as though they've got something to lose. It's the bravery to choose their own path. And I wonder again, if it's this idea of, we have to recognize, first of all, that we're unhappy. Then we have to be really kind to ourselves and allow us to feel that unhappiness and be honest about it to those yeah. around us that maybe care for us, whether it's a relationship or it's a friend or maybe a boss. And then it's that if I can give myself permission to be happy, then I will find that courage to take a leap of faith. And I'm thinking now I do some work, uh, some coaching triad work with a guy who um, was a Marine for 18 years. And he left the Marines and he went into civilian life. And all he had known for, you know, since he was 18 years old to 37 was the life of a Marine. Every day getting up, you know, making his bed, having it tested, polishing his shoes, you know, everything was order and structure. Right. And now he's building a career as a coach, and uh, working with HR professionals and helping other people find their career path. And something he was saying to me the other day in a conversation also links to this idea of courage. Most people think they're not courageous, but the human spirit is more courageous than we think. And it's a nice pivot, I think. Most yeah. people don't think they're courageous, but the human spirit is more courageous than we think. Yeah, I think it's a battle inside of us somehow. Mm. You know, um, to be honest, I, I believe for most people at that age, it's going to be a bit of a journey. It's not going to happen in a week. I don't think no. so. It's too complex what's in your mind. You've been, you've been tying what you think is part of your happiness to a lot of things and relationships and, and uh, all these things that you've done in the past. And if you can, but I think the best recipe is becoming aware that the, that the th things and the relationships, whatever it is that actually are truly uh, making you feel happy. That's usually a very, very small percentage of all the things that you own or have and people you know and so on and so forth. And you, your, your probability of losing that, even if you make a new step and uh, maybe, I don't know, you can't afford to live in that neighborhood anymore for a while, 
uh, or a couple of your friends are saying, ah, I don't want to have to do anything with anything to do with him anymore. He's, I don't know, he's now a nobody or something like that for a while. You're not losing anything of value. You still have the other part that Correct. is actually the core of your happiness. So, and I know really hacking your perspective about what do I actually need in order to wake up in the morning and feel great. And from a psychological point of view, Frank, what you're talking about is we need to rewire our brains. Yeah. We need to rewire to think differently in order to be able to move beyond what we think is the norm. Yes, and not just accept it as a given. Because you're right, it's those people that you described there in the scenario, they're, they're not worth worrying about. You haven't really lost anything and we would say that to a young person right yeah six-year-old who's upset at a friend that's not a friend they wouldn't do that to you yes don't don't worry we can rationalize it if you feel as though with happiness we maybe even got a third episode that we need to uh, unpick but if you had to kind of summarize the steps people could take to help them find a path to happiness what's your summary of where we've moved today yeah well i would say it starts with um the awareness first so i think you need to have a a alone sit down with yourself for an hour or two in a place outside your home maybe i don't know to really just take a hard look at um am i you know is there a pattern of things that that i i'm doing or have been doing um that actually don't make me happy they give me some sort of pressure they give me some sort of you know anxiety and so on um they need to look at some of the relationships that they they have also if they you know contribute to that and begin to build a list somehow for themselves that's that is behaviors and things that they could actually change without risking too much and not even asking for the big courage step yet but begin to do less of those or can you change your life circumstances in a way so that you feel more free with you know less pressure do you need to have that conversation with your parents about expectations you know depending on your age or maybe even with your wife maybe she has expectations on a certain lifestyle or something like that mm-hmm. and slowly get there Brad. slowly get there that's how i would i mean it's, it's a very short summary but that's what i would do i think this is the steps but it starts with the awareness yeah and it starts maybe by not putting expectations on ourselves that we need to make great leaps in one day. Right. It's do the, do the self-awareness and then slowly but surely build that courage by taking small steps to whatever that path could be rather than worrying what you think it should be. Yeah. That's what I'm interpreting you're saying there. Have I, have I got that right? Yes, yeah. That's what I wanted to say. I'm going to add one thing though. If I could talk to my younger self, I would encourage me to change and experiment more often. Mm. Don't let a super long time pass on a fixed path, but experiment more often, change more often, maybe change a job more often, try something new more often, because to keep that muscle trained, that you, that you know, you actually don't need courage. There is actually no courage involved, at least not much. You know, if you're, if you're comfortable with these kinds of changes that you put on yourself, that would be my advice to my younger self. And uh, I think to echo that, mine would be to, uh, to get a dog um, and uh, to use your dog as the therapist. Non-judgmental, <laughs> will listen to everything you say and yeah. will get you outside walking around where you can start to create some ideas of what your future path could look like. <laughs> he will still expect a snack from you uh, without question but as long as i give him some food and a little bit of shelter <laughs> yeah. he's joined us today although he's just turned around to go back to sleep <laughs> yeah well good good i think a good end point what you say yeah frank i think we've uh, reached a lovely point to uh, to finish on today